have um, an eight-acre-road observatory, uh, which um, also includes trees and wanders, um, the kind of group. Uh, the subject for this one is deep sky objects. So that's a uh, the second of March, um, to 9 p.m. Um, Following that, we have the observers group on Sunday, the 12th of March, which is run by Robert, uh, which is uh, 7.30 to 9pm. Uh, and then on Thursday, the 9th of March, we have another acre road event, uh, 7.30 to 9pm. Uh, and then on the following evening, Friday, the 10th of March, we have a public night, an outreach night at RSPD Lock Winning. Um, I'm not quite really sure of the time. I don't know. Did you know, Chris? The time? The one in March? Yeah, the one in March, the ISDB. Yeah. The two to seven o'clock. The two to seven o'clock, okay. And then we have uh, the, the final event uh, for the next month or so is the ESG Members Night in London Country Park. That's Tuesday, the 14th of March, at 17 pm. And uh, Zoom links uh, for the online events will be sent out to give it a time. Just a couple of uh, further announcements. Um, the Society has been um, um, collecting an extra money due to the, the option that members have to donate money. Uh, there's a, an option available on the membership form where you can uh, add extra donation. So we're very grateful for the extra money we have received that way. And the final announcement is that um, we are coming up to the end of this session. Um, to the, and at the end of the session, we have the AGA of society, where we normally elect the new council for the next session. There are a few vacancies available if anyone's interested in joining council. Um, if you are interested or, um, or do you want to join council, just speak, speak either to myself or any other council member. And that's all I've said. That's it. Uh, apologies, I just spoke down there when I said it was only two talks. Two <laughs> talks. Uh, to the a council meeting on Monday. <coughs> That's Jason Collins. Who knows? Um, so, first talk up is Robert Clark. <laughs> and Robert. So, I need to plug this box. <laughs> okay. Thank you, everybody. Right, right. right. 
First of all, I have to apologize for the quality of some of the pictures you're going to see. It's not exactly high definition, no. Uh, what I want to talk about, I thought it might be interesting that people might want to know about my radio telescope project. Uh, it's not actually, it's not, an, I, I have all these mad projects that I take up an interest in something and I drop it and I end up doing something else. Uh, and I've got all the gear and I think maybe I, I should go back to it again, you know. So we're going back to 2011. Uh, I'd always, well, I've always had really an interest in radio uh, and stuff because of my interest in the space programme. Uh, and my interest in radio <coughs> probably started on July the 21st, 1969, when I had to put on a radio to hear the moon landing, right? Because I slept through it, I was like, to my parents wake me up, you know, on top of it. Uh, before the TV came out, anyway. So, most people's idea, I'm sure some of us, I know that back in the 70s and the 80s, the society had quite a few visits to George Bank or uh, what radio telescope is, uh, and they're quite fascinating. And a lot of you might actually own a radio telescope at home, and you might not actually realise that you've got one. Uh, so you've got like a uh, parabolic dish, and the radio telescope is like equivalent to the mirror in the telescope at the observatory where I work. Uh, it's getting the light from the star. Uh, in this case, it's not the light from the stars and that and the planets. It's those radio signals. And then there's a little box at the end, a little noise block, is the equivalent of the eyepiece, which the, 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 the signals are focused in. And then you put them through an amplifier normally, and then you you'll probably have like a, a, a data controller that mentioned that, and then that puts that onto a computer. Uh, there are all different types of radio telescopes and communications and all the rest of it. So this here is, uh, this is actually a parabolic TV aerial. And, and this goes all the way back to 1986 when I was upgrading my stuff for the upcoming Voyager 2 encounter of Uranus and SDS-51L where the school teacher was going to be doing broadcast from space and I was hoping there's going to be a lot of TV coverage and I stayed 14 stories in the top of the box bar uh, high flats or what we call in Dundonian Maltese <laughs> uh, and the views were uh, fantastic as was radio TV but the problem is that the radio TV would be splattered off the other four towers basically and you, with analog television you would get like a ghosting effect so I got this, there was an area on the top of the roof that the council had, it was no use because the picture was all ghost and it was out of alignment. So what was, and it, I'm still using this a little over 38 years later, but what we are seeing here is a parabolic dish and it's taking the, the radio signals, it's focusing them, and then it's going into, in this case, to a TV area. So, as I say, a few years back I was online and I was actually looking for a small optical telescope when I came across this. And I had thought about radio astronomy, but, uh, but it was just a cost basically. Uh, there was a, a kit that became available, but, and you could do things like the Crab Nebula and all the rest of it. Uh, and, but the problem was it was over a thousand pounds and not having a garden. And I believe that the University of Glasgow actually bought one of these things for Acre Road, which some of you may have actually seen. So I seen this thing uh, uh, on the internet, and it, it was from a, it, it was, turned out it was from an educational supplies uh, company in the states, and it was a very basic uh, radio telescope. And I checked around in the UK, and nobody was doing them. And I suppose if I had uh, uh, a knowledge of electronics that I, all, I often wish I had, and it should have been, you know, I learned it when I was younger. I could have probably uh, made this, you know, out of an old satellite dish, and, you know, or even a new satellite dish. Uh, and so this is a bit very, it turned out it was very basic. So I ended up, I uh, imported it from the US. And it, it, by the time it was, I can't remember, it was about 253. But the time with all the rip-off EU taxes and postage and all the rest of it, it came to almost 400 pounds. Uh, 
So basically, it's called an RTL. I live in the light tap because that's my initials. <laughs> uh, it demonstrates remote measurement of temperature of various objects. So it's really a, like a STEM science project for kids, really, this. You know? It's the kind of thing that you could demonstrate at Acre Road or Murdoch. You could set up a radio telescope. It can demonstrate the human body or a, a, the human body or hand generate solar radio noise. Uh, one can use a data logger connected to the radio telescope output. I'll talk about that later. Solar noise magnitude can later be plotted versus time on a PC. Uh, other than astronomical applications, can be found base objects observed radiate or reflect microwaves in a manner different from that at a visible light. You know. So it included uh, a parabolic dish with 32 centimetres. So it's basically almost smaller than little sky satellite dishes that you get. Uh, um, and then that's a picture of it in box. Uh, you can see it's got an LMB that's roughly similar to what you would have on a satellite dish. And the, the, the brown thing with the screws is a, a tripod attachment. And then it came with this box, which is about, uh, it's about the size of, like, uh, back in the day, you've got a free view box to connect to your analog TV, uh, and, and it's got this signal meter thing on it, and, and what that does is it, 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 the needle moves depending on what, what you're looking at. So when you look at the sun, for example, it goes almost off the scale. Um, when we look out into the universe with it, it goes to roughly the middle, uh, and if you look, the, the thing that really fascinated me was, and I just love doing this, is that when I look at the moon, it goes to, and you'll see it kind of goes to about eight, over 10. And what's actually happening is that I'm picking up the solar radiation from the sun bounced off the lunar surface. To, you know, and that's what it's doing, you know. Uh, so it's kind of very, it turns out it, it's very invasive, you know. Uh, and so you've got these uh, red and black, so that's like plus and minus. Uh, and on the, you've got like on the left hand side, you've got like this is all it takes a, a 12 volt power supply. So that was my first problem because if I lived in a house with a garden, all I need to do is like a power extension cable and just run this out on. Uh, so I could do it in my little observatory, which is my balcony. Uh, uh, so I ended up that that's very difficult, so I took the whole damn lot up to the observatory and I did it on a, a Saturday, you know, the system go to the observatory at the weekend so you can't even really do it, and, and I had to set it up at the, at the observatory. So that's it in my balcony. So th this was, it was taken in the summer and it was uh, the, 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 the council's always greatly likes to remind us all that Dundee is the sunniest city in Britain because we're on the east coast and we got lots of sunshine. And th this is quite well, you can see that the, my satellite dish in my balcony, I know I'm getting this gone now because the council put one on the roof. Uh, that was another project I did, that was back in 2003, I sent away for all the parts to build the satellite dish to receive Chinese television, that's what that was for. Uh, and I was not being ripped off by taking out a Sky subscription and all this nonsense, you know. And I got all the bits and because the, the Chinese channel was on digital satellite, so I had to get, uh, I thought it was, I get a digital receiver. When I lived in Paisley, I had an analog, uh, a, and it got in the way of telescopes and all that in a balcony, so I don't need to assemble that. You can see this, you can see the, the, the size comparison uh, between the, 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 that now that is uh, hey, what was that that was a uh, 60 centimeter dish and the reason why that was so big was I thought I would get signal loss you know and I could actually get the, get it through the windows and to begin with I was only getting half the channels but by by angling the low noise block I could get all the channels. Uh, and there's the, 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 little, the radio telescope to the same scale, but you could actually use the big satellite dish to do it. The, the same thing. That's just another view of it. So this is it set up at the Mills Observatory out in the balcony. Uh, what we've got here is this, this 
cable here. This is what I used to vacuum the staples. <laughs> because we have to, we have to obviously do all the cleaning and all that before we open to the public. Because we, we, we might be getting, we get these inspections from Visit Scotland, and we don't want to lose that. So I mean, I do everything from cleaning the toilets to astrophysics, basically, <laughs> and planetary lectures and that. But anyway, so I, I we use this cable. So what we got, we, you know, got one of the. This is one of the kids' chairs on the observatory. It's quite tiny. You can see what the satellite can see, but the, the radio telescope receiver. Uh, and I think on that occasion, I'm, I'm looking at the sun. And that's the kids. And you can see, and then you can see the, the power. So it's a 12 volt power supply. Since then, what I've done is uh, I've got a battery box that you put a, a batteries in, uh, and that runs that runs the radio telescope. And uh, one of my mad projects was playing around with solar panels. And so then we've got a solar panel on the balcony. That's when I thought I would be able to afford electricity last year, but before the government stepped in and helped me. Uh, and so I can power up the, the I, I think I can actually use it back to run the, the radio telescope as well. So I'm looking at the sun and you can see that that needle is almost off. That's the sun, it, it, you get that, it goes off there. So I don't know if there's a variation in this depending on sunspot activity or the sun's at maximum or minimum, I honestly don't know. And this is me looking out into the galaxy. Now unfortunately I can't point this at the Crab Nebula, and I'm sorry I'm not going to be able to show you tracks and data from the pulsars and all that, it's just too simplified. The big disappointment about this telescope to me was great. I can use this during the cloud. It's a radio telescope, so the sky doesn't need to be clear how wrong I was. Because the particular part of the radio spectrum that it uses is similar to satellite vision, water, obviously, I'm just trying to say something there. In the atmosphere, it wouldn't work properly. So it, it's like a, an optical telescope, it has to be blooming clear. It's kind of. Uh, so that's the view of the, uh, that was looking at the straight in the middle is what you get when you point it straight off in the sky. And this one, unfortunately, is, uh, this is me looking at the moon. And I think you probably can hardly see it in this picture, but that blob there is the moon. Because at the moment, like at the moment, it's visible in the daytime sky. And I'm looking at the moon there. And, uh, and that's the reading that you get when you look at the moon. And I just love that because that really, I mean, that's me measuring solar radiation that's bounced off the surface of the moon. You know, I just, I just love that, you know. So then I take this uh, uh, a step further, and, uh, and this is a, a data acquisition module. And the problem was that the rip-off Britain price was going to be well over £150. So I ordered this from the United States and I got it even with the rip-off import fees, it was a lot cheaper. And this is connected up to the computer. And then it's like you see in all the horizon programs, the zigzag lines that you get, you know. Uh, but the problem is that my, I need again, it's a laptop, and my wee laptop, the battery died, and then I got another laptop, but you know, the battery, and then it's died. Uh, and I really, so I never really, you know, I ended up going on to do video astronomy at this point, you know, and I really need to, after spending this money, I really need to go back and, uh, and have a look at, you know, getting a, a, a new, I really need to get a new laptop, really, and then connect this thing up. Now, just to finish off with, uh, I, I then found out that the, 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 there was another type of radio telescope, the Yuminati cost me roughly, it cost me well over 400 pounds to get this equipment. And for, uh, you can make it, this is a design of a radio telescope that you can, this is for looking at Jupiter actually. And you, you can make this for the total cost of about 50 quid. So one of the guys in the Dundee Astronomical Society, Phil Rook, uh, is he works for the TV, what, a, a, a creeper, but it's got the transmitting people, you know. So when he, when the Astronomy Society came up to the observatory, I'm always talking to him about television issues. And uh, so he, uh, and so, so he went away and made this thing for me. Uh, it's sitting in my balcony, that's what I again never really got around to use that. I need to, so it's got a piece of wood here, plywood, which is going to be in queue, 
and then you get a bit of chicken wire. I mean, the opt-in times over the years I've talked about, we, my, Stuart Reed up in Elgin and myself when there were a lot of discussions back in the late 80s, early 90s about building a C-band satellite or dish for reception of CNN to record the space shuttle. And to the, in those days, it, you know, it was before the Astro satellite, so you, you really needed a big bit of the money and other things. So it's like chicken wire, and then you've got like three type of four canes of dowling, and then you've got a copper wire here. And, ba and you get a, you go on eBay, and back in the 80s, I used to do a lot in the 90s of shortwave listening, uh, particularly to Radio Moscow for stuff, there's the Soviet space program. Uh, so what you do is you get a shortwave radio and you connect the radio telescope up to it where you disconnect the aerial or cut a bit of wire around the aerial. And you can also take a, a lead out from the headphone socket to record, record it on a cassette tape. Uh, so yeah, you, can, you can see the, the set up there, you know, with the wires and all the rest of it. And finally, this is so you have a radio telescope and you can see that the, you tune in and what you're basically hearing is a wee bit of radiation and stuff that's going on in Io. So when Jupiter's there, you basically point this thing at uh, Jupiter, and then you, at 21 megahertz, you tune in and, and you get radio frequencies. One of the things I want to do with the, the, these telescopes is to try to, I think then is to connect up an audio source to record the sound. You know, from you know the data. What does that sound like? You know, uh, so you might remember like the computers back in the 80s, like the ZX Spectrum. You hear the, 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 the computer data. You know, and we used to see that in space documentaries and all that back in the early 70s when they were the satellites. So I hope you all found that interesting. And I'm sorry for the quality of the pictures. I'd like to obviously do it again in high definition, multi 4K, if I get it off and running again. That last, that last uh, uh, contraption is fascinating. The guy who made it, I noticed it said a diameter of, well, a diameter or circumference of 53 centimetres. Mm -hmm. But it's the circumference or the, di or the actual diameter. I think um, it's the diameter of that copper. Yeah. Okay. So it's a di what the diameter of the loop. 53 centimetres. I'm just trying to work out what so frequency. So it's a copper wire, yeah. 170 millimetre so long. So 53 in diameter. So the actual length is about three and a bit times that. 750 centimetres. I'm trying to work out the, the resonant frequency on it. Right. Which is nothing like 21 megahertz. Oh. Fascinating. Right. <laughs> so I've got no idea. You know more about radio than you've Yeah, it's interesting. You know that that's what it is. Yeah. So I've got this thing in bits and pieces in the balcony at the moment, you know. Uh, and 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 you, you it's just for Jupiter, you know. Uh, so like the other one, you can't do the planets, you can't do the crab end or any of the high pollutant stuff. Uh, but so, uh, but there you go. No, I can't do hundred and seventy millimeters long. Yeah. All right. If you Google it, it's a web page. I pinch these off again. It's like a mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's a simple radio telescope for Jupiter. Mm -hmm. Obviously, not big. Because yeah. I, you know, I remember when I was getting these pictures and I was looking at that, that other one and so do that. Yeah, radio amateurs, that, you're talking about the moon and how fascinating you are. But there's a, quite a, a, a subgroup of, of the radio amateur fraternity that do a thing called moon bounce. And yep, they communicate right. by uh -huh. just yes, bouncing right. their signals uh -huh. uh, yep, uh, off the moon. Yeah. It's just like, like a super satellite. Yeah. There is another type of telescope that is on the NASA website. You can get, they give you all the plans and it costs about £258. But it's like an infrarometer. But the problem is it's a, more like a school project that you would argue if you live in a big house in an estate or something that's huge, you know, maybe the king could do it. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know He's got you know, a big garden, you know. So you need, you know, the, the wires are going to be quite, quite, you know, long. You know, like a school playing field. And the, the, that's on the, I think it's called that. I, I can't remember, the Juno Telescope or something. It's on the NASA website. 
And some there were when the time I was looking into this, you could hear a make the box and the like. If you could go to Mapland and get all of it, it was open at the time. Or there were, I think there were companies in the United States that would supply you with a ready made receiver. Yeah, the great thing about that is you wouldn't have to worry about parabolizing it, would you? No. <laughs> <laughs> Right. In some respects, I guess it's a lot easier than what to go astray when it comes to telescopes. And so my, my main issue at the observatory is basically is cleaning the mirror, is the thing that I'm. Okay, we don't use that telescope in the summer, and then when we go back in October, you know, because we're pretty near the tea and all that, and other issues with it. Uh, maybe just comment that yes, Glasgow University has been offered at least three radio telescopes. Oh, but Graham Wood has had to turn down at least one of them because the cost of putting in the foundation yeah. to right. build it up is going to be um, ridiculous. For that. I think back in the 90s, Graham gave the society a talk about making a satellite, uh, I mean, a radio telescope from a satellite dish, you know, or thing you did. You did. At that point, time would be on me. <laughs> well, it's one of the most more popular practical labs we run across to uh -huh. do mapping of the hydrogen photosynthesis. Like, like uh -huh. the, the big dish that's on the, right. on the roof of the building. Right. Right. Thank you, Ken. <laughs>
So what I managed to capture most of the, the, the sunset is here, we've got a couple of nice uh, sunspots up here. These images are taken about oh, 10 or 11 years ago. So um, if I remember right, the, this was quite an active one, this sunspot here, and it, uh, I think it reduced um, a minor storm. And of course, you get this one here, I think it's also one thing as well. And I think you can mean, as I was mentioning earlier, on about Lynn Dashing, which I think you can just about see around the edge of the sun. Okay, this is a um, much the same idea, although this is a sort of showing the top half of the sun. That's the two sunspots again. Just so most of these are uh, 30 uh, second sequences. Okay, so that was a couple of um, images taken in white light. So now we're moving on to. So this is. Um, Taken in each alpha, uh, each alpha image with the, the small Orion imager. And if you just watch, there should be a nice little prominence coming into view. Hey. Now, I'm, not, I'm not actually sure if you know, if uh, these are two separate prominences or if it's maybe an arc, I would. Yeah. It's maybe not just the resolution just hasn't been. I think you can just make out. Strong enough yeah. to make it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I think you can actually just make that out. It's all. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. And then this is taking the tail. Um, this is a less known image, so you can see. And this tall one is there. Again, that might well be. A, I think there is a sort of loop structure there. And I think there's one up here as well. One thing you'll notice is the uh, it's quite grainy the images because they're not really it's not really high resolution, but it gives a, a you know some sort of sense of movement. Okay, so one's a bit washed out, it's a bit uh, sort of over saturated, I think, but then it does bring out these problems it's quite nicely. They've got better than what I got because we've got the, like that in the observatory, the same telescope, oh. and I tried it with the Orion eye piece, but your pictures are better, David. Mm -hmm. And then this one here, this is, um, I'm hoping this comes out. So this is uh, uh, an image taken off the face of the sun, and this was uh, just a bit able to see, uh, this is a filament which I was talking about earlier. So this is a huge. Uh, mass of gas which is being lifted off the surface of the sun is held in place by magnetic fields. These things can be several hundred, several hundred thousand miles long. And um, they can be either quiescent or active. And when they do, they do become active, they, they, can, they can become unstable and actually uh, reduce uh, store of failure and actually lift material right off the surface of the sun. So I was uh, especially pleased with that one. Uh, this is one of my favourite ones, so as you can see. This actually looks as if it's uh, been filled off the surface of the sun, and it looks as if it's a, a separate um, mass of material. I guess I'll show another smaller one up here. Yeah, I like 
analogs pulk, bet šā pulka nebūt šīs. Vai ar lākšanu nie, bez no labai mums ļoti tas ir. Vāršana ir šeit, tas ir es, es gribu vērt, kā jau viņš bija stopšanas nie. Again, this is the phenomenon. So watch this thing. Oh, this is a good one. That's one that there wasn't a <coughs> clever about anything. It was just a, just a standalone um, uh, telescope on a, on a tripod. You know, that, that was no sort of, no, that wasn't clever about anything I saw this. The sun was just a way to drift across the screen. But uh, yeah, so um, I hope you enjoyed the images. Um, as I said, I'm not an expert. This is purely entry of label stuff, um, which anyone can do as long as you have it, the right equipment. Um, guys like Alistair here, who runs the energy group, they're, they're really experts. But um, yeah, thanks very much. You see, you managed, to get the, so you managed to get the granulation in the sun's disk, yeah, which is, because I tried it with the, the Align Starshoot eyepiece, with yeah, we, yeah. we put the PSP at the, the observatory, but I, I was not, I didn't really get brilliant results. I, I need to, 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 I need Radio astronomy, mm -hmm. I've read it a lot, so no. I haven't done so. But, um, I would like to get back to do it sometime, but yeah. I'm very pleased with the, the results that I did take. Any questions? Mm -hmm. Have I seen that? Mm -hmm. uh, question? Yes, I forgot. Yes, I think. Um, well, the, the thought I had while watching this um, previous thought was um, just wish we had more clear skies in Scotland. Uh -huh. They call this Sunday Holly Shepherd. Yeah. Have you tried the planets or the moon video? I've tried the moon. Um, the the, the thoughts were great, and Jupiter as well, but I mm. didn't, you don't really see much. I was just got a white dot. Yeah. And the moons. Yeah, I got a white for the when I was trying the imaging tributary, I got mm -hmm. I got the disc, but there was no need to it, it was just very white. There was one night with the bit of fog. I got the moons as yeah. well. The bit of fog coming in off the T yeah. and I managed to get the that dimmed it down so I get the equatorial yeah. axis. So how do I remember I had we had a go with the societies um so, which one recently? What the PSD? Yes. No. Because we probably have enough mounts no. to track some oh. uh, at Epo. Oh. We could definitely do that. Oh. You and uh, you and oh. the other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The problem is that uh, uh, I, the two, the, the images which I, I showed, um, I don't think they're on the market now, they've long been stupid. No, that's right. The, you can't, the Orion's is it's no longer available. Uh, that's how I got it for 19 quid. They must have been sold off at the time. Now would be a good time because the sun's coming up to a solar maximum in yeah. the next couple of years. So quite a few sunspots about. And of course, we associate the, 
the sun with summer, something uh, solar observing is something we can do it's year round. You know, so you can do it. Where do you think? Um, I think it's white light cabbages I took that were, that were actually in January yeah. on the bright January day, so we can do it any time. So, what can you use it in time? Yeah. It's a, a broad first parcel filler, you remember them, right. that's a baby snail. They, they, they produced uh, an excellent uh, white light filter, especially for the ETF, ETF activity. You can buy sheets of solar filter yeah. paper anyway and just stick them on, on the lens of your binoculars if yeah. you want to and do it yourself. Yeah, yeah. You could actually thread on and really secure. I mean, I've got a solar telescope with a dresser one that's a very basic thing. It's like a short focal length you know, reflector and it came with a cap with a, the Vader foil type daylight filter. And the way it's got a colour, it makes the sun look yellow. But that's the problem. Is that on white? No, I don't know how it's the, the colour in the filter. Yeah, that's the one I had. It's oh, pretty good. Three inches. That's what I call the two-man slot telescope. Well, the first telescope I ever had, first service was on the solar film that you can buy. I think it would cost me about 15 quid. Yeah. A yeah. bit of cardboard and some tape. Yeah, yeah. I did that as well. Just make sure they're on tight. Same as that. I did that to Cornwall Eclipse in 99. I sent away for it to broadcast film parts of it, an A4 sheet of the beta foil, which was about 20 quid or so. And I made up a little three inch cap of dioptric reflector celestron and I cut it out and made a cap, you know. Uh, and I always hold it up to the light, make sure there's no holes in it before I use it. Thank you, David. Thank you. We have our third talk, uh, and Jim will be speaking to us about some of his crazy ideas in, ast uh, in astrophysics. astrophysics. Yeah. No? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. I think it's good to do it now. Yes. And because I have no idea what the running order is, I'm still going to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Can you see if I left a little bag, you see a little bag on the desk there, I think it's, you can see a little black bag. Did I leave a little bike up there? That's just a little bike at the desk. I mean, did it for a point in the Is this the bag? No, it's a wee tiny bag, but it's a wee mess. It was a wee kind of computer. A wee tiny thing, was it? Nobody's going to stick that. Oh, it's okay, I've got that found up for now. Panicking is. Yeah. Yeah. 
You know when you're careful. <clears throat> I'd like to talk to you tonight about a few possibly crazy ideas I've had over the last couple of years about astrophysics. So the first one I was on the internet and found out about Sia. Now, Sia is a girl's name, and if you go on Google, Google it, you get all these statues, but if you keep going, you'll find Sia is a mythical planet which is supposed to have smashed into Earth quite a long time ago, thousands of millions of years ago. Now, they say it was either an L4 or an L5 Lagrange points, which nobody ever explained, so it was either here or here. And this goes round, this is the Earth going round the Sun. This is the Moon going round the Earth, it didn't exist at that time. The James Webb telescope certainly never existed at that time. This point here, if something stuck there, it's attracted to the Earth, it's attracted to the Sun, and it stays there for a while. Out here, it's attracted to the Sun, it's attracted to the Earth, and a way, way back, I've got a vague recollection that there was a film about the next night, way before the current series, where aliens were hiding here, because you can't be seen through this, this Sun. Now, my point about Sia, there's a massive problem with life on Earth. If you assume that Sia hit the Earth, that the Earth just accreted, it was very, very hot, it was molten. And when you calculate all it takes to cool down, it's much, much longer than the fossil record shows you for life existing. So the Earth is too hot for life to exist and life existed before that. So, nobody seemed to be particularly bothered about that. Now this bit of stock press, I picked this up, there's a bit of your clouds heading out away, but I don't think I'll see it. So, this is Enceladus. Now Enceladus is one of Saturn's moons, and it's covered in ice, very reflective. That's not a problem for us. The problem for us is that the ice at the north and south pole is very reflective. If it melts, Sea water is very, very dark, so the earth will heat up. Now, Enceladus seems okay for the moment. If you look at Iceland Enceladus, this is from NASA's uh, website. You get the surface, you've got water, ice, and carbon dioxide ice. You've got ocean, and then you've got rocky core. Now, this is not all over Enceladus. If you assumed it was, it's about 6%. If you scale, and sell this up to, I don't want, the proposed size of Thea, which is about Mars size. If you take 6% of that, roughly that water matches the Earth's ocean. This is the latest NASA video. No, this keeps me feet. Sorry about that, I hope you're not too deaf. It's a computer simulation which they did, and they say the moon formed in about a few hours. If I skip ahead, I think 30 seconds. You can see fear coming in, hits the earth, sends a big shockwave through, and everything melts from. The massive impact, the big, best bang since the big one, because it was the first big old girl. I don't really understand this, because if you look at it, when this second chunk comes in and hits, you can see the Earth rotating, and you can see what became the Moon also rotating, and they seem to have the same period as if the Moon is geosynchronous with it. Now maybe I'm missing something here. That the moon's period around the Earth is about 28 days, so, but it was closer to being less than that. And the moon, the Earth might have spun faster, but I don't think this quite matches up. Yeah. I just say I could be totally wrong on that. So, if 
See, it was coloured in ice. If it smashed into the earth, which the current is it did, that ice had been fired off into space the way you would be if you're in a road accident, you're not going to see that. But eventually, it would be picked up by the earth, it would have cooled way, way down in space, picked up by earth, condensed in air, then it condensed in the moon, it would evaporate off. The moon's not able to hold surface water. Well, maybe it's got a particular water underneath, but not in the sun. So maybe, just maybe, that explains it. And maybe we'll be able to move to the next slide if I can figure out how to do this. Please do this. I think if I close this. Yeah, okay. Right. Okay, so that's just basically what I've said here. Um, it could be. The life formed in the upper atmosphere where it would be wet and cold, but the earth would have cooled down a lot faster if it had been water on it. Sorry, it was. Okay. Right. I go to the next slide here. This was another one of a large bang in the earth. It's not the biggest recorded bang, it's the biggest filmed one. The biggest one in sort of known memory was Krakatoa in 1883, which was a VDI 7, a massive explosion. This is a Hunga Tonga Hunga Happy. Not so an eruption. Right. This in 2014, according to this, this volcano is here. It erupted in 2016 and joined these two islands together. Now, if you look at the scale, that's a few kilometers away. So it's a big eruption. And here, you've got the actual caldera, the mouth of the volcano. And it's been washed away. Now, NASA were looking at this, fortunately, they were looking at it from a satellite and didn't have people on the ground. This is a pre eruption, I don't understand why it's pre eruption, sir, because it is erupting. So, if you look at it here, it's big, bigger, biggest, gone. Right? Now, that blast went four times around the earth. People are talking here about amateur equipment. You can buy a barograph to measure the atmospheric pressure for about 20 seconds quid now. And somebody in Scotland sent them to the weather magazine for the Royal Meteorological Society. And they showed you the four peaks. When Krakatoa, if Krakatoa blew up, that could call Krakatoa, but they really didn't call it Krakatoa. So that's, <laughs> that's it. It went seven times around the earth. At least. One of the things that did happen was people at the antipodal point, so you crack it for a hunger, 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 happy, what do I? We should be glad that all these volcanoes have got these odd names because if you had one called Vinko, you'd be in serious trouble. And I think Vinko is supposed to be a super volcano. On a par with um, all the other ones. Uh, where is it? Where are those ones? Yellowstone. Yellowstone, then. That's it. Yellowstone, then. So, when this goes, when this went off, a satellite picked up a shockwave travelling right across the world. Because when the shockwave comes across, there's a pressure wave that became. It squeezes the atmosphere and it heats it up. And the satellites are so sensitive they can detect that. I tried to get this for you, but I couldn't. But have a look at it on the internet and you get it. So if you have a look at this here, and then if you go to the next slide, this is Mars. Right? This is almost certainly a volcano in Mars, and I was annoying my granddaughter the other day, and I said, here you can see there's evidence of water. That's rubbish, she said. <laughs> yes. 
Then I go back to my previous one. Look at this bit here, and then you look at this bit here. It looks as if this is wave erosion. So this seems to be evidence that water, that Mars was covered in water before. Or if you're my granddaughter, this is evidence of lava flowing down here and making a great big part. So get your pick. Now this <laughs> odd thing, I gave a talk once off the cup. And I got this wrong. <laughs> this is a KPG boundary. It's the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary, or KP. <laughs> and that's just to remind me to get the name correct. <laughs> Learn over this. Now, if we go to the next slide, this was the best bang after fear. This is the one you're all familiar with. This is an asteroid in Chicxulub, and apart from the fact that everything here is just gone, it's a plasma, it's way into space, probably the bits of this in the moon. They found dead dinosaurs, they're not about any live dinosaurs, they okay. <laughs> dead dinosaurs. Yeah. With their heads bashed in, blunt force trauma from big chunks of rock, they whacked them in the head here. Uh, 65, 66 and a half million years ago. So what? Well, we can get to the next slide and get to see that. This, <clears throat> if you look at it, this is quite a thing. No, stay here so you're still, I'm still in the view. Thank you, your team. This is silicon. This is based on silicon being a million. And this graph, this scale here, you can see the fine shape I've got here, but it goes up 10 at a time, a factor of 10. So here it's a 10 times bigger than that, here it's 100,000 times bigger than that. This, these are the concentrations of all the elements on the earth, as far as I know. And have a look at these ones here, ruthenium, rhodium, palladium, and osmium, iridium, and platinum. There's gold. And gold's not very, it gold's pretty rare. It's not as rare as iridium, and it's not as rare as osmium. This is palladium here. This is palladium. So when I go, I'm going to get to rated with this ring. Millions of years from now, you'll find a microscopic layer of the <laughs> and it says palladium. No. Oh. Oh, I've got one back. So how about it? Tiny, tiny concentrations of these. And then have a look at this. This is a concentration of elements. And here's this platinum group, metals as they're called, ruthenium, rhodium, palladium, rhodium, iridium, and platinum. And these numbers here are how much more common they are in asteroids. So we've been back, these two guys, the Alvarez. Above the sun, found more iridium in a layer. Now, I don't actually understand what it's really talking about here. Right, well, basically, there's this Cretaceous Paleogene boundary. I think we cut it right. <laughs> and below it, there's dinosaur fossils, and above it, there's no dinosaur fossils. And this is evidence for this massive impact, which they then found in cheeks of often on basically drilling broad. So here's a picture of all these poor dinosaurs, and they, they're watching the fall back. This is the one that you saw in the north of the US, watching the power put the belt in the head. Now they gave them a massive fright, and they, here's some of the results. Now, these are in sale with eBay. I'd be very wary of it. If it stinks, it's fake. Yeah. Now, ah, now, what I think we're meant to do is clean this up. I knew yesterday had a spare time, spare day, and then the phone rang. Oh, Dad! So, I should have deleted this. this okay. I can't get it to rhyme, I don't know how. Maybe copyright is worse. Yes. It should, um, 
Yes, you can go that long, then. <laughs> um, that's what the fancy word for dinosaur too. Now, if you watch the program called The Curse of Oak Island, I wasn't actually 100% sure it wasn't fake. But I got this photograph of it, and you hear the place. Oak Island is an island off the coast of Nova Scotia. And according to what they're saying, everybody and their granny, even the Romans, got there before Christopher Columbus discovered America. However, they built this big dam here and they're working in this and so on. And they're looking for treasure from buried there by the Knights Templar, gold, which they somehow got from the Spanish, and the Spanish basically stole off the Aztecs and the Incas, who basically got the mayors to mine it. So, so what? Well, this is Superman and Lewis Wayne, and they. Uh, when we look at things, we see different colours of light. And we can identify that this is the green jumper or that's white light or whatever. If Superman used his entry of vision, I know Superman doesn't exist. <laughs> Every machine doesn't exist, you never know. If you were to lose away with his entry of vision, which I used to wonder about, <laughs> he won't see elements below sodium. Because when the X-rays hit the element, they pick the electrons up, the electrons fall down, and they give out characteristic, depending on what energy levels they jump through. So you can identify elements from the X-ray fluorescence. So you can buy a machine that you can lose And we're not talking 200 pounds here, by the way. It's, we are talking thousands and thousands of pounds. And you can you just stick Piece of material under it and tell you exactly how. Um, now, the people in the island dug up, sorry, they found in the beach, so they were like, oh, it's copper. And they did an x ray for us, oh, it's copper, great. Here's rhodium. Now, I looked this out, I think it's about 0 0.06%. And you've got geochemistry, and nobody picked this up. So they get copper, zinc, iron, and arsenic, never split that at the, at the end of a line. And rhodium, right? Now, this is the one that we got the end one. Don't this, they're saying, gold, baby, gold. And my wife and I are sitting there, and I'm going, iridium, baby, iridium, baby, oh, isn't there baby and wife? I don't get any smart now, I do right. right. So, look at the iridium, look at the osmium. 1.44%. If you knew where this came from, you'd mind this if you more money than some of the folk would call it. Wasn't it was very expensive. They mine about two tons a year as a byproduct from um, nickel refining. So I don't know where this came from. So my hypothesis, and you can trash it if you like, this is an unknown asteroid impact. Because there's a huge concentration of osmium in America. It probably came from South America because it was from Aztec gold. And I'm suggesting here that that's why they took it, well, they took it from the Spanish. What does that mean? Well, if it was a big asteroid impact, it could have caused a mass extinction. There's evidence of an unknown impact site. Let me caution you, please, against going looking for it. All the men who went and looked for the Aztec gold didn't come back, except one. He said he found the gold and he took some, as much as he could carry, because gold's very dead. So he went on a ship and halfway across the voyage he got off the ship and he, he was never seen again. And he only told somebody what was going on. So the next slide here. These are mass extinctions. Now, this one, this is the end of the Cretaceous, which does not begin with a K. This is a KPG and bounded. Right? And that was what did in the dinosaurs. But there's been other mass extinctions, and you don't know what caused them all. Some of them might have been big impacts, some of them might have been in the oceans. 
just firing back hydrogen sulfide or whatever poison or whatever. Now, I thought, great, I've discovered a new asteroid, a new asteroid site, and they're going to be famous and so on. So I wrote to the Wagina brothers, the old pile, sent them a letter, no reply. I wrote to a new scientist, no reply. I emailed astronomy now, it wouldn't even go. I wrote to nature, no, they reply. He said, that's very interesting. Don't fold us, we'll fold you. <laughs> No, we are away then. I wonder what it would be like. I always wondered what it would be like to see an asteroid coming coming straight at me. So I modeled a 20 kilometer asteroid traveling at 10 kilometers per second. It's a near extinction level event. It's always going to do you again. Now, I think that this is correct. I don't know if it's, if it's possible to make it correct. No. Right. Okay. Maybe let's try and take you through if I can remember how to do it. Right. So I'm mentioning here the angle of your eye. So that's out here. Right. Well, this asteroid is 10,000 kilometers away. It's out in space. So the 10 kilometers per second, and you have got a thousand seconds to live. About 17 minutes. Point one of a degree, you won't see it. If you look for it in your telescope, you're going to be very unlucky to see it because you're going to be even more terrified. A thousand kilometers is a hundred seconds less, a couple of minutes really, and it's 1.2 degrees. You might see it just that. hundred kilometers, that's a common way. That's quite tricky to get that one by the way you print it. <laughs> so that's where you get space, you get a camera in mind, you get the atmosphere. I know it doesn't, but, you know, but that's what they say. So if you're going to be a lot of money to go into space, you want to go above the camera in mind, then you're an astronaut. Some people pay a lot of money to it. Right, so what have we got here? 10 seconds to go. Right? If in the atmosphere, at 10 kilometers up, 10 kilometers per second, one second away, you don't need to worry about that. Because when this hits the upper atmosphere, as Professor John Brown said, antiambatically compresses the air. The air can't go out the road, so it's piled up like a Titan, same as if you pump up an air a bicycle tire. And people still do such things. The pump gets hot. Right. So this thing will be roasting hot, roughly about here, your eyeballs are burned out, and you are wishing you're dead and you're going to get your wish. <laughs> so where are we? At this point, so it comes in, where are we? Here. Right, seconds to live. Ten. Right. Ten seconds to live, you see it like that. And it goes right the way around. And that's it. Right? And that's the last day of Jimmy and the Rock. <laughs> so, they reached the day and they're gone. Jeez. Now, this is a section through the Earth. And uh, this could be an earthquake. There was two massive earthquakes. And when you look at things like Iris, which measures Earth, people can call the earthquakes. There was about 20 odd massive earthquakes in between the two seventh or seventh years and the Richter scale. And these send out waves like this coming out. The change here and the change here. Have a look at this bit here, please. Which is there. These waves are meeting again. If I can hold this steady enough. Now, the other thing that happens is it reflect. And they'll come bouncing back and so on. Right? So, sources of seismic waves. If you get an impact on the Earth, 
And that's the way he comes in. It'll send these waves out like you get with the earthquake. But it'll send a pulse straight through. And the point diametrically opposite, that pulse will bounce back. You were here. It's going to fire you up. The ground comes up about three to six meters. This was calculated out by a guy, J. Mellish, who I've got the right to the he died. Um, so, that's quite a massive effect. So, you know, big um, meteorite impacts, I think, since 1908, we're not quite sure if that actually hit. The massive earthquakes, you know, volcanic eruptions. I want to be a sitter for a second. Dead impacts. You know, if you watch the TV series, Silent Witness, Vera, they walk in. How did he die? Is it the sea bullet wounds in his chest? No, one force trauma. What? What? His head's bashed in. Somebody bought a meteorite and he'd be in heaven with it. Oh, it's <laughs> <one. laughs> so always blunt force trauma. Here's what I think might happen. If you get an impact of a meteorite punch, you walk into an iron a bar, an iron bar, then waves will go out through your skull. Now your skull is not what's called homogeneous. It's not all the one material right through it. Otherwise, I know people wrong with see your bone head, but you know what I mean? Bone is your skull and your, your brain inside, and that's got liquid, it's all sorts of crinkly stuff and so on. Mm -hmm. So consider two waves going out. You bounce off here and you come back along here. This wave comes along here, bounces off, comes back. This wave comes along, bounces back. Probably doesn't cause a volcanic eruption inside your head, but it bounces back. If I um, scroll back for a minute, a shock wave coming straight through from an asteroid, lifting this up six meters, will split the earth, might cause a volcanic eruption. Might be that what I actually did in the dinosaurs was not that impact or the sort of nuclear winter, but the fact that it may have triggered a volcanic eruption that created the Russian steppes, which is a big massive basalt field. So, what conclusions can you get from all this madness? We, the theories cover if it existed, might have cooled the earth enough for land to form before the ice. There may have been undiscovered impact sites somewhere. Not what point to tell anybody from here, but they really care. Uh, I think brain impacts may be a lot more dangerous than people actually believe. They don't stick the heavy foot bones, they don't knock asteroids. Big asteroids only hit about once every hundred million years. If you go on eBay and you feed there's nothing you can't polish, if you get six or six and a half million years to do it then. It's a current mass extinction, the Anthropocene. Mm. I'm a bit baffled by one of the bits here. Uh, I have lost it. Mm. Anyway, where are we? Last one. Right. My take on all of this, you probably won't know it's an asteroid that kills you. Not no asteroids or footballs, that's awful. And remember one thing. You'll be okay unless an asteroid has got your name on it. Okay. <laughs>
I don't know, is it, are you suggesting that the asteroids came from outside the solar system and that's why there's such different chemical compositions to how the Earth and the other planets are, are made up and may have been traded between areas? If the gold had been mined, mm -hmm. then it would have been purified. They used to do people in for having platinum because you could add platinum to the gold and sell it as gold, whereas we think platinum is expensive. Uh, so it would have been different. So it, but the problem, I don't think it's a massive, massive amount. Yeah. 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 Well, anyway. Thank you. So we'll get to the quiz. So uh, Ellie has very kindly offered to fill in for Andrew. And uh, I will do that. Yes. I'm just going to take the card. Yeah. 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 I'm going to be a bit of 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 yeah, uh, yes. Uh, it's a bloody hard. Are you? Did you not win that? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I seem to have a habit. I remember winning one year, yeah. um, which is a bit embarrassing. <laughs> for four years in a row, four or five years in a row, I was on the winning team in Airdrie for the Christmas quiz. And I sort of felt it's possibly me that was winning it. <laughs> There's yeah, Alice Amanda's yeah. question. My God, so yeah. Well, And I was having a bit about the history of astronomy, right? Well, yeah, well, that, that Victorian bloke had never written it. Well, half of it comes from Jewel Lanyon's. Yeah. He was an astrophysicist. Yep. Yeah. 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 Very good. Yeah. Chance of a pension. Yeah. That's very well. Yeah. I'm not a native English speaker, and I already know that some of these words I can't properly pronounce. <laughs> I hope you'll see on the slide, and I'm sure we have enough experts in the world to help me pronounce them. Uh, in the interest of time, we've got 20 questions. I'm just going to get started. Then. So we have a room until half nine, so we need to be, it needs to be speed quiz. Um, so, so these slides are made by Andrew, so I, you know, I'm just going to read them out, basically. Uh, he created five parents. Tell us on for warming up. <laughs> uh, question one. Which statement is not true? A. Glasgow is an asteroid. B. Glasgow is in Montana. C. Glass was an ideal place for seeing the wonders of the night and sky. Yes, that's an easy one. We've got to see on this little bit. Question two. What is the Latin name for Earth's moon? A. Ulna, B. Nalu, C. Luna. By the way, just sitting at home, you're watching this live stream, feel free to participate, but you can't win a prize. Thank you. Question three. The Jovian moons are A, not moons by Jove, B, moons of Jupiter, C, the happy moons. Question four. What is the brightest star in our night sky? A, the sun, B, the north star, C, Sirius. And that's all for warming up. <laughs> Continuing with the picture round. Uh, what pictures are taken? How far, how far away is M31, the Andromeda, Andromeda galaxy? A, 2.5 million kilometers, B, 2.5 light years, C, 2.5 million light, light years. Question six. The Ple Pleiades? Pleiades. Pleiades, thank you. Or M45 is a star cluster. What is another popular name for it? 
A, seven sisters, B, seven dwarves, B, seven dudes. Seven, what is this nebula called? A, Pegasus, B, horse head, C, chest. <laughs> The secret of the night sky. <laughs> what great nebula is close to the Running Man nebula? Mm -hmm. A. Owl, B. Orion, C. Dumbbell. Question mm -hmm. nine. By what name is this phenomenon known in the northern hemisphere of the Earth? A. Northern Sights, B. Aurora Borealis, or C. Aurora Norealis? It's not very easy for you. <laughs> it's not very easy for me. <laughs> well, he did say apparently the last few years it was he was it was based with him that the quiz was very hard. <laughs> These are arguments. Yes. Yes. We haven't seen the, the later rounds. Okay. <laughs> Round three. Number ten. Which of these is the dimmest? A. A first magnitude star. B. A sixth magnitude star. Or C. A star of magnitude minus one. Eleven. Which one of these can be seen from Glasgow? A. The Magellanic Clouds. Okay. Uh, B. The Southern Cross. Or C. Scorpius. Twelve. Which of these is not the name of an official IAU constellation? A, Orsa Major, B, Orion, C, Scorpio. Thirteen. What type of telescope can be built using only lenses? A, Newtonian, B, Schmidt, Cassegrain? Mm -hmm. yep. C, thank you. C, refractor. And then round four. Fourteen. Which one of these is a star? A, Alpha Master. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Oh, God, God. I'm not sure that he's got this one tight. Oh, they want, they want some action on the way high to the VHS, I'd be asking. 15. What point is farthest from the zenith? A. The horizon. B. The south celestial pole. Or C. The nadir. Sixteen. Which one of the following is not the brightest star of its constellation? A. Alpha Ursa Majoris. B. Alpha Canis Majoris. Mm -hmm. Or C. Alpha Ursa Minoris. Mm -hmm. I can't be right. <laughs> it is. Mm -hmm. uh, Alpha is only the brightest star. Yeah, not all different constellations. Not. not always. It's not in Orion, for instance. Right. <laughs> That's back to normal. Then. <laughs> Question 17. The current solar cycle, number 25, is expected to reach its maximum in 2025. In which year did the cycle 25 begin? A. 2023. B. 2019. C. 2015.
2013. The destination of the Discovery One spaceship in the film 2001 A Space Odyssey was Jupiter. Earlier draft of the plot had it heading to which other planet? Oh, it's an easy one. A. Mm -hmm. B. Saturn. C. Neptune. Nineteen. According to astronomical tradition, and much to the annoyance of chemists, what are metals? A. Elements more massive than iron. B. Elements more massive than hydrogen. C. Elements more ma massive than helium. Mm. It's the first one I've actually known 100%. <laughs> Good luck with the next one. The lower the field equations from the general theory of relativity for salt and But even Anne realized that was too bad. So which statement helps explain why they usually why there are usually two tides per day at the same point X on the Earth's surface? A. The configuration of the Moon, the Sun, and the plate X is repeated every twelve hours. Uh, B. The Sun and Moon pull the oceans in opposite directions at X. Or C. Because the gravitational force exerted by the Moon at X changes, and X is rotating with the Earth. Mm -hmm. Do you want me to repeat any of the questions? I think that's what we can do. Just show it. Oh, yeah, just on trust basis, just grade it yourself. There's a lot of time. The question was number one, which statement is not true? It's not true that Venus is an ideal place to be in the one. <laughs> number two, what is the Latin name for Earth's moon? moon. Three, Jovian moons are moons of Jupiter. C, what is the brightest star in our night sky? Sirius. The Andromeda Galaxy is 2.5 million light years away. The Pleiades are yep. um, also called seven sisters. This nebula is called the Pleiades. That is. I've never heard of it. I've never heard of it. Um, the Great Nebula close to the Running Man Nebula is Orion. Right. It's called this phenomenon in the Northern Hemisphere. It's called the Orion. Right. <laughs> Round three. Which of these is the dimmest with six magnitudes? Which of, which of these can be seen from Glasgow? That's all. To be fair, I thought it was a trick question. Nothing can be seen from Glasgow. Could be, because there's more than one of them. Uh, Scorpio is not an official IAU constellation. Telescope can be built using only lenses. Am I saying that right? Yeah. No worry, I'm Scottish and I'm dyslexic, so I can struggle with lots and lots of them. Pegasus. 
Okay, last round. Question 17, uh, cycle 25 began in 2019. Mm -hmm. The earlier dots of the movie, uh, Chris Bates should go to Saturn. Yeah, so it was too difficult for Stanley Kubrick to do Saturn, but it's, it's, it's not open to this Saturn. He just turned around, rings around, is not it? We don't know how to CGI by the sixteen. Elements more massive than helium are defined by astronomical tradition to be mass. Mm -hmm. And we have a question twenty. Yeah. And I'll see if they're right. Yes. Yes. Sorry. Number three. Four. Okay. Um. Please count. Yeah, you're correct. I don't actually know what a price is. I think David knows what it's What's our price? So we're going to look at the total. Um, who has more than 10 answers correct? Who has more than 15 correctly? Who's got more than 16? 17? 18? 19? 20? 19. Oh my forget. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I'm gonna win this. <laughs> Name the two astronomical objects in this Hubble Space Telescope image. I don't even have the answer on you. Um yeah, okay, got it. He didn't put them in the You've got that one. You've got it? Yeah. How do we? You just want to shout it out together. So we'll do it. Serious AMB. Serious AMB. Yeah, that's what I thought it would be like. No, serious AMB. Thank you. Okay. Oh, yeah. He traveled 60 miles to get here, so I'm saying. 100. Oh, my goodness me. Thank you. That's really nice. Thank you so much. Can I just say, um, it's some of you probably know, I've been a member on, on and off of the ASG for quite a number of years, but not for the last three and a bit because of COVID. And I live a long way away, I live over 100 miles away. And it reminds me of the driving up today, especially as I got to the middle of Glasgow and I was terribly tired and terribly worried about get, driving into a bus lane and getting photographed. Terribly fine, what have you. Uh, years ago, and I haven't been for quite a number of years, I used to go quite a lot to the States, to all the various star parties in the States. And I remember the very first one I ever went to was the Texas Star Party in 1992. And I'd just gone there by myself. I didn't know anybody. And I was standing at the back of the queue for dinner. You know, it was a self-service. And all these Americans chat to each other. And I at the back there. And I, you know, I made some zilter comment. And these two guys turned to me and said, gee, you from Australia? <laughs> <laughs> I've come from... Scotland, and they said, Gee, you come all this way from Scotland, <laughs> you're gonna win a prize. He said, yeah, 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 we always have a prize every time we have a star party for the person who's come the furthest. And sure enough, I got the prize. I thought, I'm onto a winner here. <laughs> the other American star party I went to, they did the same thing, and it was brilliant. I was getting a prize every time, it was brilliant because it was a real icebreaker. I got to talk to lots of people, so I imagine that what you guys ought to do every time you have 
one of these members now at Johnson here. You need to have a prize for the Persian strength. There's two thirds of my memory. Thank you very much. Thank you.